This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, we'll be starting with uh, chapter number 13. However, I wanted to um, add a little bit of commentary on the last hadith of the previous chapter. Uh, chapter number 12, Babu Ma Ja'a Fi Dhikri Khatami Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The chapter that mentions the ring of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hadith number 8, the last hadith of the chapter, was very interesting narration uh, that has some historical context to it. So now that Imam Tirmidhi Rahmanullah Ta'ala has presented a few different narrations which tells us what the ring of the Prophet Sallallahu looked like, what it was made from, what its purpose was, what was drawn on it, why exactly the Prophet Sallallahu had a ring made, etc. Now in the final uh, hadith of that chapter, he talks about the history of that ring, what exactly happened to the ring of the Prophet Sallallahu So he mentions a narration of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. That he says the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a ring made by Ya'la bin Umayyah that was made of silver. And it, he used to wear it, meaning kana fi yadihi was in his hand, that it was in the possession of the Prophet sallallahu and he would wear it. After the passing of the Prophet sallallahu because it was not just a personal effect of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because that would probably more likely belong with a family member or something, um, but this was something that the Prophet sallallahu used to use as the official seal, um, as the head of state. So therefore it passed on to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Even though Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, if he would write a letter, he would sign with his own name. He wouldn't necessarily place the seal of the Prophet sallallahu on it. But it's just, it still seemed fitting for it to be in the hands of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at least symbolically, uh, to say that this is now officially the head of state. When Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away, he passed it on to Umar ibn al-Khattab. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And again, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu as a head of state kept the ring and it was in his possession. When Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu assumed the khilafah, the leadership, it passed on to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now it says, Hatta waqa'a fi bi'ri aris. Until it fell into the well called aris. Now a couple of different things I wanted to explain here. First and foremost is this well of Aris was not too far from the Masjid of Quba. So it was a little bit outside of Medina on the way to the Masjid of Quba. And it was a well that was in a garden and it, this garden and the well used to basically belong to a Jewish man. Um, and the man's name himself was Aris. And so the well was named after the owner. Uh, of that garden in that well. And so it was just known as a well of Aris. And Aris was actually the ma- name of the man, the Jewish man, who originally owned the garden and the well. And the word Aris, um, in the uh, Aramaic language, it means uh, Falah, it means farmer, in the Aramaic language. So that's a little bit of history about that particular well. Now this narration, the reason why Imam Tirmidhi brings it, is because this is the most general narration. It just says that the ring fell into the well. It doesn't mention exactly who dropped it. Because we have a couple of different narrations. There's one narration specifically that says that um, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the one who actually dropped the ring into the well. And another narration mentions that it was Mu'ayqib 
radiallahu ta'ala anhu Mu'ayqib was a sahabi and this particular sahabi at the time of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu um, rather excuse me at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu Mu'ayqib radiallahu anhu was kind of like a personal assistant to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and therefore he similarly served uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Uthman radiallahu anhu. And one of the responsibilities that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu had given him was that he had given him certain things for safekeeping. And one of those items that he had placed with him for safekeeping was the ring of the Prophet sallallahu itself. So this was, so Mu'ayqib was the um, individual responsible for keeping the ring safe. So one narration actually mentions that it was Mu'ayqib who dropped the ring into the well. How those narrations are reconciled? Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab. There's a lot of different speculation from the different scholars how they try to reconcile this. Some of the scholars say that maybe Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu had requested it from Mu'ayqib to maybe place it on some type of a document or just had asked for it to keep with him for a few days. And then he was there at the well and maybe washing his hands or doing wudu or something and it fell into the well. Or it very well could have been Mu'ayqib as well who had it for safekeeping. And for some reason or another, maybe just to again, you know, sort of have the ring with him, um, was carrying it on his person, and it fell out of his pocket or off of his hand into the well. In either case, what the narration mentions is that when it did fall into the well, قَدَ بَالَغَ عُثْمَان فِي التَّفْتِيشِ عَلَيْهِ فَلَمْ يَجِدْهُ Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu made a lot of efforts to try to recover the ring, but they were not able to recover it. Some of the narrations also mentioned that نَزَحَ Jamia ma il bi'ri that they basically extracted as much of the water of the well as they were able to. They kept placing buckets down there looking for it, but they were never able to recover the ring again. And um, so that was basically the history of the ring. There is another thought that is shared by some of the scholars. Alama Bajuri mentions this in his sharh that. Some scholars also talked about the fact that the ring being of the Prophet ﷺ did have a certain blessing or at least a certain uh, symbolism to it. That basically after the ring had become lost, after it was lost, shortly thereafter was the time when many of the fitan began. A lot of the different difficulties and some of the conflicts began at that time. Where the khawarij, the rebels, the extremists, they basically invaded Medina, which eventually led to the assassination, uh, the shahada of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And from there on forward, there was a lot of uh, unrest within the community. And it's, it seems that the losing of the ring coincided with the onset of a lot of those difficulties that befell uh, that generation of the ummah. Wallahu ta'ala alamu bisawab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next chapter, chapter number 13. Babu ma ja'a fi takhattumi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear the ring. Some other versions of the text of the Shama'il Muhammadiyah mention the title of this chapter as Babu ma ja'afi anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yatakhattamu fi yaminihi The chapter about the fact that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear his ring in his right hand. So let's go ahead and read through uh, some of the narrations and then uh, we'll talk about some of the issues pertaining to this um Particular Mas'ala Qala haddathana Muhammad ibn Sahl ibn Askar al-Baghdadi Wa Abdullah ibn Abdul Rahman Qala haddathana Yahya ibn Hassan Qala haddathana Sulaiman ibn Bilal An Sharik ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Namir An Ibrahim ibn Abdullah Ibn Hunayn An Abihi An Ali ibn Abi Talib ibn Radiallahu ta'ala anhu Qal A'a عن أبي عن علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله تعالى عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يلبس خاتمه في يمينه. The first chapter of this, uh, the first hadith within this chapter. Ali bin Abi Talib رضي الله تعالى عنه relates that the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to wear his ring in his right hand. 
The second hadith. قال حدثنا محمد بن يحيى قال حدثنا أحمد بن صالح قال حدثنا عبد الله بن وهب عن سليمان بن بلال عن شريك بن عبد الله ابن أبي نمر نحوه It's the exact same text of the hadith Imam Tirmidhi just brings it from a different chain from a different um, uh, chain of narrators The third narration, the third hadith قال, قال حدثنا أحمد بن منيع قال حدثنا يزيد بن هارون عن حماد بن سلمة قال رأيت ابن أبي رافع يتختم في يمينه فسألته عن ذلك فقال رأيت عبد الله ابن جعفر يتختم في يمينه قال عبد الله ابن جعفر كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتختم في يمينه In this particular narration, Hamad bin Salama, rahimullahu ta'ala, who is one of the earlier scholars, he was also one of the teachers of Abu Hanifa rahimullahu ta'ala, he says that I saw Abdullah bin Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu wearing a ring in his right hand. So I asked him about that. He said that I, um, excuse me, Hamad bin Salama says, I saw Ibn Abi Rafi' wearing a ring in his right hand, and I asked him about that, and he said, I saw Abdullah bin Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhuma wearing a ring in his right hand as well. And Abdullah bin Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear a ring in his right hand. Abdullah bin Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu, <clears throat> both him and his father are sahabi, uh, they are sahaba, they are companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the son of Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abdullah, the son of Ja'far bin Abi Talib was actually born in Habasha itself. So Ja'far bin Abi Talib who was the leader of the community of believers that was, refu- that was living in refuge in Abyssinia, he was a leader of that community, and this is his son, Abdullah, that was born at that time. So he also interacted with um, the, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was old enough to remember that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also used to wear his ring in his right hand. <clears throat> the next hadith, قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا يَحْيَىٰ إِبْنُ مُوسَىٰ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ إِبْنُ نُمَيْر قال حدثنا إبراهيم بن الفضل عن عبد الله بن محمد بن عقيل عن عبد الله بن جعفر أنه صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يتختم في يمينه Once again, another narration about Abdullah bin Ja'far رضي الله تعالى عنه relating that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to wear his ring in his right hand. And in this particular narration, if you look at the Arabic itself, he refers to the Prophet ﷺ with the pronoun, annahu, and that who, that pronoun is actually referring to the Prophet ﷺ, which isn't always clear. And sometimes some students, uh, beginner students when reading the text, could become confused that this is referring to Jaffa, Abdullah bin Ja'far himself, but rather he's referring about the Prophet ﷺ. The next hadith, hadith number five. قال حدثنا أبو الخطاب زياد بن يحيى قال حدثنا عبد الله ابن ميمون عن جعفر بن محمد عن أبيه عن جابر بن عبد الله أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يتختم في يمينه. This narration, Jabir bin Abdullah رضي الله تعالى عنه relates that the Messenger of Allah, that the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to wear a ring in his right hand. Uh, a little something about the chain of narration with this particular narration. <clears throat> if you look at the narration where it says, حدثنا أبو الخطاب زياد بن يحيى قال حدثنا عبد الله بن ميمون عن جعفر بن محمد. This is Ja'far al-Sadiq from the family of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And of course, he's a very notable member of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, oftentimes, uh, he, he was a man of great knowledge. Uh, Abu Hanifa rahimullah ta'ala says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَفْقَهَ مِنْهُ I never saw anyone who was more, uh, who more deeply understood the religion than Ja'far uh, bin Muhammad rahimullah ta'ala. He relates from his father, who is Muhammad al-Baqir. 
Muhammad al-Baqir. And of course, he was also called Muhammad al-Baqir. That al-Baqir was his laqab. This is another uh, family member of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the son of Ali bin Abi Talib, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. And he's referred to as al-Baqir, لِأَنَّهُ بَقَرَ الْعِلْمَ أَيْ شَقَّهُ وَعَرَفَ خَفِيَّهُ وَجَلِيَّهُ So he was called al-Baqir because he mastered knowledge. They said that basically he went down to the finest point of knowledge. So because of that, he had that title. And <clears throat> so he relates now, um, Muhammad al-Baqir relates from Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu used to wear his ring in his right hand. All right, the next narration, <coughs> hadith number six. قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ حُمَيْدِ الرَّازِي قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا جَرِيرِ عَنْ مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ إِسْحَاقِ عَنِ الصَّلْتِ بْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ قَالَ كَانَ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُمَا يَتَخَتَّمُ فِي يَمِنِهِ وَلَا إِخَالُهُ إِلَّا قَالْ كَانَ رَسُولُ الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتختم في يمينه. As-Salat ibn Abdullah, As-Salat ibn Abdullah, excuse me, Rahimullah Ta'ala says, that ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, used to wear a ring in his right hand. And then, wala ikhaluhu, he says that, and I'm almost certain that he used to say, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, وَلَا إِخَالُهُ إِلَّا قَالْ I am certain that he used to say that the Prophet of Allah Wasallam also used to wear his ring in his right hand. Now, um, the only thing, again, the, it seems to be very repetitive and redundant. I'll explain exactly why Imam Tirmidhi is doing this for a very specific reason. Uh, one very interesting word of the Arabic language that is kind of an abnormal word in the Arabic language, and that is the word, وَلَا إِخَالُهُ مَعْنَاهُ لَا أَظُنُّهُ it means that I do not assume or I do not think except that he said. So it's an expression to basically say whenever you have a nafi, al istithna ba'd al nafi. Al istithna ba'd al nafi yufidu tawkid. Whenever you have the, an exception being made after a negative statement, that provides the benefit of conviction. That is a way that the Arabs would emphasize a statement is that you negate something and then you place an emphasis. So the way that it would more make more sense to translate it is, I am certain that he used to say. Now the reason why I say that this is an abnormal word, because normally it comes from khal, khala yahulu khial, which means to think, to think, to know something. So normally as a verb coming from mudari'ah, from the present slash future tense form, it should be bifatih hamza It should say, wala akhaluhu. But the Arabs, now this is sima'an. This is how we hear the Arabs saying it. Alright, so if somebody, mashallah, is a sarf expert, and they find this to be abnormal, no one cares what you think. Right? It is not your language, it is the language of the Arabs. So the Arabs would often say it abnormally, with a kasra on the hamza. And they would say, wala ikhaluhu. وَهَذَا عَلَىٰ خِلَافِ الْقِيَاسِ this does not follow the rules of the Arabic language because that's how they roll. All right. So they would say, "Wala ikhaluhu illa qal," and I am certain that he said that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also used to wear a ring in his right hand. The next hadith, hadith number seven of the chapter. قال حدثنا محمد بن أبي عمر قال حدثنا سفيان عن أيوب بن موسى عن نافع عن ابن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اتخذ خاتما من فضة وجعل فصه مما يلي كفه ونقش فيه محمد رسول الله سم وفي رواية ونقش فيه محمد رسول الله ونهى أن ينقش أحد عليه وهو الذي سقط من معيقيب في بئر أريس this particular narration, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had a ring made from silver. 
And the, he used to place the top of the ring towards the inside of his hand. And he had inscribed in it or on it, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And he forbade anyone else from having that inscribed on their ring. And that is the same ring that fell accidentally by Mu'ayqib, that Mu'ayqib accidentally dropped in the well of Aris. So we've talked a lot about the concepts here. I'll take the questions afterwards. So we've already talked about a lot of the concepts here. So I wanted to go ahead and explain uh, a couple of things in the verbiage, in the language that, Imam, uh, that the narration actually uses in this hadith that Imam Tirmidhi brings. First and foremost, of course, it says that the ring was made, and we've talked about that, the Prophet ﷺ hired uh, Ya'la bin Umayyah to make the ring. It was made from silver. And then the top of the ring, um, where the gemstone usually goes, but instead of that, there was an inscription on the ring that said, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ used to wear that part towards the inside of, it hand, uh, inside of his hand. So he used to wear it, not normally how you would assume that it's worn, where it shows on top. The Prophet ﷺ would turn it to the point where, where it said, Muhammadur Rasulullah most of the time would be on the inside of his hand. It would be on the inside of his hand. And again, we talked about that in the previous chapter, that the reason why the Prophet ﷺ did it, was because the Prophet ﷺ did not wear it for the purpose of vanity, he didn't wear it for the purpose of decoration. And the Prophet ﷺ was a very humble person, of course, the, the epitome of humility. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not like to attract attention, uh, to himself in that manner. And so the Prophet ﷺ would normally keep it turned to the inside. And then he had inscribed on him Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he forbade anyone else from getting that same inscription on their ring. We also talked about that as well. The reason for that was so that there wouldn't be the possibility of any forgery, but that was only extended to the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That theoretically speaking, if somebody did have that inscribed on a ring or something today, then that would not fall under the prohibition of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But that was only during his lifetime, while it was still actively in use. Then he mentions, and the narration is very specific. So I, I talked about how it fell into the well of Aris, whose hand it fell by, difference of narration. But he, this narration mentions that Mu'ayqib was the one who dropped it in the well. But then it says something very interesting. Instead of saying that, أَسْقَطَهُ مُعَيْقِيبٌ أَسْقَطَهُ مُعَيْقِيبٌ فِي بِئْرِ Aris, Instead of saying Mu'ayqib dropped it in the well, it says, Sakata min mu'ayqib. Right? And so that type of verbiage is indicative of an accident. That type of verbiage, when he adds the min, it fell from mu'ayqib. It fell from mu'ayqib. So almost like having something in your pocket, maybe you lean forward and it falls accidentally. That's kind of the idea. It accidentally fell uh, by mu'ayqib into the well of Aris. The next narration, hadith number 8. قال حدثنا قتيبة بن سعيد قال حدثنا حاتم بن إسماعيل عن جعفر بن محمد عن أبيه كان الحسن والحسين يتختمان في يسارهما. In this particular narration, it's related by Muhammad al Baqir. So again, you have Jafar bin Muhammad, Jafar al Sadiq. Relating from his father Muhammad al Baqir, that Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, used to wear their rings in their left hand. Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the grandsons of the Prophet, used to wear their rings in their left hand. Now there's two things I, I want to point out. Obviously, of course, we understand who Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhum are. They are the grandsons of the Prophet sallallahu They were at the tender age of six and eight at the time of the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nevertheless, they still benefited from the love and the affection and the company of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On top of that, you know, their mother Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the beloved daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, passed away only six months after the passing of 
the Messenger Wasallam. But nevertheless, they grew up with the tarbiyah and the affection and the, the love of their remarkable father, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So they... Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, their actions very much would be a hujjah and could be taken as an interpretation of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That being said, there are two things about the narration itself. First and foremost is the fact that um, historically speaking, uh, Muhammad al-Baqir rahimahullahu ta'ala, he actually did not see Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself. He did not see Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself. So from that particular perspective, this basically has an inqita in that regard in the Sanad. It's what we would basically call uh, an extended form of like a mursal narration. But he did not see him himself. The other thing is that uh, Alama Iraqi and some of the others also mentioned the fact that this is a weak narration. The chain of narration itself is weak. Not because of any of the individuals on the front end of the narration, such as Muhammad al-Baqir or Ja'far al-Sadiq, but later on going down, this is a weak narration. So because of that, this really cannot be used as some type of evidence or proof. So now that we've seen seven narrations which repeatedly are saying that the Prophet ﷺ wore his ring in his right hand, now Imam Tirmidhi brings his eighth, eighth narration which demonstrates the fact that the grandsons of the Prophet ﷺ, Hassan and Hussein anhuma, would wear their rings in their left hand, but it is a weak narration. Imam Tirmidhi is aware of the fact that this is a weak narration. What exactly his perspective is of bringing it, I'll explain in just a minute. And then in hadith number 9, um, Imam Tirmidhi again comes back to the similar narration. قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ قَالَ أَنبَأَنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ عِيسَى وَهُوَ إِبْنُ الطَّبَّاعِ قال حدثنا عباد بن العوام عن سعيد بن ابي عروبه عن قتاده عن انس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه انه صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يتختم في يمينه Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu relates that he, meaning the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to wear a ring in his right hand. And then the final narration of the chapter um, explains uh, another interesting uh, narration about the Prophet ﷺ wearing a ring. قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ عُبَيْدٍ الْمُحَارِبِ قال حدثنا عبد العزيز بن ابي حازم عن موسى ابن عقبه عن نافع عن ابن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال اتخذ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خاتما من ذهب فكان يلبسه في يمينه فاتخذ الناس خواتيم من ذهب فطرحه وقال لا البسه ابدا فطرح الناس خواتيمه عبد الله بن عمر radiallahu ta'ala anhuma mentions that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a ring made out of gold. So first and foremost obviously this is before the prohibition of wearing a ring made from gold. Wearing any type, this is before the prohibition of men wearing gold. This narration itself uh, is also found in Bukhari and Muslim and also in the Jami'ah, the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi. And Imam Tirmidhi brings it here in uh, his collection on the Shama'il as well. So it is an authentic narration that the Prophet ﷺ had a ring made, for gold, made from gold and it was before it was prohibited. And so the Prophet ﷺ used to wear it in his right hand. So people started, meaning other men also started getting gold rings made. So the Prophet ﷺ removed it and discarded it. And he said, I will never wear it ever again. And so the people also then discarded their ring as well. And the Prophet of Allah وسلم, in an authentic narration, he says that he, he pointed to gold and he pointed to silk. He pointed to gold and silk and he said, هَذَانِ حَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ ذُكُورِ أُمَّتِي حِلٌّ لِإِنَاثِهِمْ He pointed to gold and silk 
And he said that these two things are forbidden for the men, the males of my ummah. This is forbidden for the men of my ummah, but it is permissible for the women of my ummah. And aside from that, obviously, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala um, mentions an ijma on the fact that tahrimu takhatum bi dhahabi mujma'un alayhi al-ana fi haqqi rijal That there is ijma, there is a scholarly consensus on the fact that it is prohibited for men to wear gold. Some scholars have uh, mentioned uh, the... Some scholars have mentioned that there are some who hold the opinion that it's actually makruh, only disliked for men to wear gold, but that opinion is rejected by Imam Nawawi, and he actually mentions that even Imam Muslim in his Sahih mentions that there is ijma on the fact that wearing gold for men is haram, it is prohibited, it is not allowed. So now to explain a little bit about why, number one, why the redundancy? And then secondly, why Imam, Nawawi, why Imam At-Tirmidhi excuse me, brings a narration about Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhumah wearing a ring in their left hand in spite of it being weak. And Imam Tirmidhi actually being aware of the weakness of that particular narration. Then why does Imam Tirmidhi actually bring it? So... There are, there is a difference of opinion, and there are certain narrations that um, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sometimes wore his ring in his left hand. There are actual narrations to the effect that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore his ring on his left hand. So. Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah ta'ala personally is of the opinion that those narrations are not sound, they are not authentic, and he rejects all those opinions. And so Imam Tirmidhi is one of the scholars who is of the opinion that no, there is no authentic historical evidence and proof of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ ever wore his ring in his left hand. He exclusively wore it in his right hand when he did wear it. All right, and that's why Imam Tirmidhi says in his Jami'ah as well that the narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore his ring in his left hand la yasihu. This narration is not authentic, and therefore I do not accept it. So that's why Imam Tirmidhi is of this opinion. So he brings what. Uh, seven narrations would say authentically that the Prophet ﷺ wore it in his right hand, right hand, right hand. And then he brings one narration, which is a weak narration to show the fact, to demonstrate the fact that look, this is a weak narration. That's the only narration I was able to find. And it's a weak narration. And it says that he wore it in his left hand. And then that's why he, again, in the ninth hadith, he brings it back to the right hand to prove his point. However, that being said, Imam Tirmidhi is in the minority amongst the scholars on this particular issue. There are in fact narrations, a number of them, that prove that the Prophet of Allah wasallam was seen uh, wearing uh, a ring in his left hand. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala says that there are narrations that say the Prophet wasallam wore it in his right hand and in his left hand. However, he says, أَنَّتَّخَدْتُمَ فِي الْيَمِينِ أَصَحُّ شَيْءٍ فِي هَذَا الْبَابِ عَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ So, وَإِذَا كَانَ تَخَدْتُمُ فِي الْيَمِينِ أَصَحْ فَلَا وَجْهَ لِلْعُدُولِ عَنْ تَرْجِحِ أَفْضِلِيَّتِهِ وَيُجْمَعُ بَيْنَ رِوَايَاتِ الْيَمِينِ وَرِوَايَاتُ الْيَسَارِ بِأَنَّ كُلَّ مِنْهُمَا وَقَعَ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَحْوَالِ أَوْ أَنَّهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ كَانَ لَهُ خَاتَمًا كُلُّ وَاحِدٍ فِي يَدٍ كَمَا تَقَدَّمَ الْجَمْعُ بِذَلِكَ بَيْنَ مَا فَصُّهُ حَبَشِيٌ وَمَا فَصُّهُ مِنْهُ So um, that Imam Bukhari rahimullah ta'ala mentions that while there are narrations that prove both, the narrations that prove that he wore it in his right hand are more authentic. So there is no doubt about the fact that that is better and that is more virtuous. Nevertheless, there is no doubting or rejecting the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did wear his ring in his left hand as well, and there is some evidence of that fact. Now, uh, Imam uh, Hafidh, Al Hafidh Zainuddin Al Iraqi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, one of the uh, Muhaddithun and also one of the uh, major scholars of the Shafi'i uh, school as well, he has a little 
poem, a nazam, Al-Hafidh Ainuddin al-Iraqi rahimullahu ta'ala was known to basically take a lot of different sciences and commentary on different things and he would basically turn them into poem. Um, and so he says about this particular issue, when reconciling all these narrations, he says, يَلْبَسُهُ كَمَا رَوَى الْبُخَارِيُّ فِي خِنْصَرِ يَمِينٍ أَوْ يَسَارِ كِلَاهُمَا فِي مُسْلِمٍ وَيُجْمَعُ بِأَنَّ ذَا فِي حَالَتَيْنِ يَقَعُ أَوْ خَاتَمَيْنِ كُلُّ وَاحِدٍ بِيَدِي كَمَا بِفَصٍ حَبَشِيٍ قَدْ وَرَدْ He says that, he used to wear it as Imam Bukhari narrates in the small finger, in the little finger, the pinky finger of both his right and his left hand. Both of these narrations are found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim and they can be reconciled by understanding that either he would sometimes wear it in his right and sometimes wear it in his left. Or we can also understand that he had two rings and he used to wear both of them at the same time, one in the right hand and one in the left hand. Just as we said about the stone, that did his ring have a habashi gem or a habashi stone or not? We understand that by saying that he had multiple rings. He had, one, he had two different rings. Um, so similarly, we can say that the Prophet ﷺ sometimes actually would wear two rings. And what we also learn from what uh, Zainuddin al-Iraqi mentions here, al hafid al-Iraqi mentions, is that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, the hadith tells us, that when he would wear his ring, whether it was right or left or both, he used to wear it in his little finger. He used to wear it in his pinky finger. And again, the reason for that, some of the reasons or the wisdom of that that the scholars mention, because again, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't necessarily wearing for it to be noticed, that he would wear it towards the middle of or the top of his hand. But the Prophet ﷺ would actually turn it around to the inside, right? And that way it was more out of his way when doing things, because he didn't want it interfering. And then the last ruling that I'll share with you about the wearing of a ring, is that, so the, the scholars mention that based on off, uh, of all these narrations, it is permissible, the only type of jewelry that this proves is permissible for men, is the wearing of a ring. And based off of the narrations, men can wear one ring, or at the most two rings. And of course for women, there's no restriction. Men, as we talked about yesterday, cannot wear gold rings, but they can wear rings made from anything else. And there's no restriction upon women. And then the last issue is that if somebody does choose to wear a ring, and then they are performing tahara, like such as making wudu, then tahrikul khatam. يَجِبُوا تَحْرِيكُ الْخَاتَمِ It is important to move the ring while making wudu, to make sure that water gets underneath. All right, that the ring is not some exception, but that skin that is covered by the ring also is necessary to wash in wudu. So it is important to move the ring around so that to make sure that water gets in there, even or best, better yet, to just go ahead and remove the ring. And that's actually what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. When he used to perform tahara, he would actually remove his ring before making wudu. Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab. The next chapter. باب ما جاء في صفة سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. The chapter about the sword of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Cool stuff. All right. So the first hadith in the chapter, Imam Tirmidhi brings five hadith in the chapter. One is of course, again, just um, the same hadith with a different chain. So there are four unique hadith within this chapter, but there is a lot more, um, some extra commentary that is found uh, by other scholars and mentioned by other scholars. So I'll be sharing some extra details about the sword of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Tirmidhi brings a very limited type of narration where he doesn't really um, get into the specific swords that the Prophet ﷺ had, but generally mentions. قال حدثنا محمد بن بشار قال حدثنا وهب بن جرير قال حدثنا أبي عن قتادة عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه قال كانت قبيعة سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من فضة Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu relates that the handle of the sword of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was made of silver. 
The handle of the sword of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi was made from silver. One of the things I forgot to mention that is very um, beautiful, Imam Tirmidhi, again, you see the methodology of hadith scholars, that they don't organize chapters just at random, uh, but they actually have a methodology to how they organize their chapters. This is a more deeper issue from the usul of hadith, the sciences of hadith, but there are different types of collections that organize chapters in different ways. For instance, when a, a book of hadith is called a al jamia then that basically organizes the chapters based on beginning with theology, creed, and then going through the obligations of Islam. So then obviously salah would come next, um, but of course tahara is a precursor to salah. So it will be chapters pertaining to belief in theology, um, uh, and then it will go on forward from there, talking about things like tahara, salah, and so forth. Then there is a chapter called, there is a type of collection of hadith called the sunan. The sunan are typically organized in terms of chapters of fiqh. So a lot of those hadith scholars that organized hadith books uh, with the format of the sunan were oftentimes fuqaha as well. They were scholars and experts of fiqh as well. So they organized their hadith books based on chapters of fiqh. And then of course another example would be the musnad or masanid. Those are chapters organized by the narrator. So all the ahadith mentioned by or narrated by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu will be in one chapter. Then there will be a separate chapter for all the narrations from let's say Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and so on and so forth. Alright, such as the musnad of Imam Ahmad. So Imam Tirmidhi, this is a shama'il, this is its own unique type of collection that describes the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That being said, Imam Tirmidhi still has a methodology within chapter from chapter. So the scholars actually mentioned that in the previous chapter, he talks about the ring of the Prophet ﷺ. We know what the purpose of the ring was. The purpose of the ring was for the Prophet ﷺ to be able to officially stamp and seal documents that were basically letters inviting other kings to Islam. That was basically da'wah. And the methodology of jihad itself was that whenever you go to a place or a region, you, uh, of course the sahaba, what they would do is they would first um, give da'wah to the people before engaging in any type of qital or battle. And so similarly, after mentioning the ring of the Prophet ﷺ, then now he's mentioning the sword. Another consistency that he mentions here is of course, one thing that we came across very frequently when talking about the ring of the Prophet ﷺ, is that it was made from silver. And because the hand handle of the sword of the Prophet ﷺ was also made of silver. So that's why Imam Tirmidhi chooses to bring it now, mention it here. So he mentions here that Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the handle of the sword of the Prophet ﷺ was made of silver. Hadith number two. قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ بَشَّارِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُعَاذُ بْنُ هِشَامِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا أَبِي عَنْ قَتَادَ عَنْ سَعِيدِ بْنِ أَبِي الْحَسَنِ قَالَ كَانَتْ قَبِيعَةُ سَيْفِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مِنْ فِضَّةٍ سعيد ابن أبي الحسن البصري رحم الله تعالى mentions the very same narration that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم sword the handle of the sword of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was made from silver now this narration is what we call a mursal Alright, a mursal basically means that a tabi'i, somebody who was a student of the sahaba, and did not meet or see the Prophet ﷺ, him or herself, narrates something about or from the Prophet ﷺ. Skipping the sahabi from where they got the narration from. Alright, and again as I mentioned, this is not done maliciously, but this is done sometimes just coincidentally. Alright, or just due to habit or frequency of narration. The narrator himself, this is the brother of Al-Hasan al-Basri. The great Al-Hasan al-Basri from the generation of the Tabi'un, one of the Kibar al-Tabi'in. He was known to be the mo- one of the most knowledgeable of the generation after the Sahaba. And he is called the most knowledgeable of that generation amongst the Muslims of Iraq in that generation. Al-Hasan al-Basri. This is his brother. And so what's very interesting is that he is referred to as Sa'id, the son of the father of Al-Hasan al-Basri. Very interesting. Very cool. Alright, little brother. Alright, so Sa'id, the son of the father of Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, relates that the handle of the sword of the Prophet ﷺ was made of silver. The third narration within this chapter 
قال حدثنا أبو جعفر محمد بن الصدران البصري قال حدثنا طالب بن حجير عن هود وهو ابن عبد الله بن سعيد عن جده قال دخل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مكة دخل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مكة يوم الفتح وعلى سيفه ذهب وفضة قال طالب فسألته عن الفضة فقال كانت قبيعة السيف فضة So in this particular narration, Hud ibn Abdullah, Hud ibn Abdullah, he narrates from his grandfather. Now his grandfather was a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ and his name is mentioned to be Mazbuda. Mazbuda. It's a unique name. But nevertheless, his name was Mazbuda. He was a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimullahu ta'ala mentions in the taqrib that his name was actually Mazida, but um, the scholars however say that it is more likely that his name was Mazbuda. Um, so he relates that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca on the day of the conquest of Mecca and on his sword was gold and silver. On his sword was gold and silver. So there's a difference of opinion. And so Talib says, I asked him about the silver and he said that the handle of the sword was silver. And so there's a little bit of a discussion as to what about the gold? Because Ibn Tifaq, all the scholars are in agreement that uh, a man is allowed to basically adorn or decorate his sword using silver. That is permissible. Obviously, by the overwhelming authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. However, the question now begs that, what about the gold? So there's a difference of opinion about it. Some actually say that that is a mistake of the Sahabi. He thought he saw some gold or he assumed that he saw some gold. And some narrations mention that there was maybe a little bit of gold that might have been on there, um, but it was not um, either, it was not at a level that was problematic, like it was very, very little, or it was just simply the fact that maybe the Prophet ﷺ at that time was not aware of it, that the gold was on there. Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab, it's more likely that the narrator was mistaken. The fourth hadith of the chapter, قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ شُجَاعَ الْبَغْدَادِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَ الْحَدَّادِ عَنْ عُثْمَانِ بْنِ سَعْدٍ عَنْ إِبْنِ سِرِينَ رحم الله تعالى قال الصناعة سيفي على سيف سمرة بن جندب رضي الله تعالى عنه وزعم سمرة أنه صنع سيفه على سيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان حنفيا so محمد بن سيرين محمد بن سيرين Rahimullah Ta'ala, who is again one of the most knowledgeable amongst the generation of the Tabi'un, he says that I, ha- I had my sword made exactly or identical to the sword of Samura bin Jundub, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Samura, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, used to claim that he had made his sword exactly uh, as a replica of the sword of the Prophet wasallam, And his sword was Hanafi. Alright? <laughs> that doesn't mean in fiqh. What that means is that it was like the swords of Banu Hanifa. Banu Hanifa was a tribe of the Arabs at that time. Very tragically, very tragically, Musaylama al kadhab Musaylama al kadhab la'anahullah, the, the false prophet Musaylama, the liar who claimed prophethood during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, Musaylama, who was later on killed during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he belonged to that tribe, unfortunately. 
Um, so Banu Hanifa, the thing, why does he attribute the sword that the sword of the Prophet ﷺ was like the swords of the people of Banu Hanifa or it was made by one of the people of Banu Hanifa? The thing, one of the things that the people of Banu Hanifa were very noted for, one of the things that they were very popular for was that they were expert craftsmen. They were blacksmiths, they were sword makers. All right, so they used to craft very intricate, very nice swords. So the sword that was given to the Prophet ﷺ was either made by someone from Banu Hanifa, or it was very similar um, in its look and in its shape to the swords of the people of Banu Hanifa. And that basically was the fact that they would make the handle from silver, um, that that was one of the primary things. The other thing was that there was a certain amount of smoothness to the sword as well. And sometimes what they would do is they would put like a little bit of a design on the sword itself. They're running down the sword in the middle of the sword, not the blade, but in the middle of the sword itself, that they would sometimes put like little uh, in indentations or a little bit of a design going down the sword. All right? Um, so those are some of the things that are mentioned that what that exactly means. Now a little bit more detail about the sword or rather the swords of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that some of the scholars mention um so first and foremost obviously um as i mentioned already wa qad kana lahu sallallahu alaihi wasallam suyufun muta'addida the prophet sallallahu alaihi had multiple swords um, some of the scholars mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ had up to seven different swords. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ had seven different swords. Uh, Ibn Qayyim rahimullahu ta'ala, Ibn Qayyim rahimullahu ta'ala in his book Zadul Ma'ad, in his book Zadul Ma'ad about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he mentions the names of the swords of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had names for his swords, and um, he mentions that there is a poem that is written about the names of the swords of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is attributed to uh, Alama Balqini. It says, "Lihadina min al asyafi tis'un." So I stand corrected, excuse me. La, la sab'un tis'un. Lihadina, the Prophet ﷺ had nine swords. Lihadina min al asyafi tis'un. Rusubu wal mikhdamu dhul fiqari. Qadibun hatfu wal battaru adbun. Wa qala'i wa ma'thuru al fujari. That the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, Lihadina, for our guide. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he had nine swords. The first one was called Rusub. The first sword was called Rusub. I believe that it is um, precisely the sword of Rusub that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So first to go, uh, so to go ahead and just kind of mention the names first, and I'll tell you just a couple of details about a couple of them that we do know. So he says the Prophet ﷺ had nine swords. One was called Rusub, Rusub, Mikhdam, Dhulfiqar. Number three, Dhulfiqar. Number one, Rusub. Number two, Mikhdam. Number three, Dhulfiqar. Number four, Qadib, Qadib. Number five, Hataf. Number six, Battar. Number seven, Adbun or Adb. Number eight, Qala'i. And number nine, Ma'thur. Ma'thur. These were the nine swords of the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, just a little bit of detail about uh, just a couple of them that are very fascinating that some of the scholars share. Al-Ma'thur. Al-Ma'thur. What's very interesting is that the word Al-Ma'thur in the Arabic language means like something that is received from someone previously. Athar. Athar means some, like a remnant. 
Athar means a remnant. Ma'thud is something you get from someone else, a remnant of someone. That's why we say when we learn something from the Prophet ﷺ or from the Sahaba, it's called an Athar. It's a remnant of the Sahaba. Ma'thud is something that comes to us from them. It's one of their remnants. The reason why the Prophet ﷺ named one of his swords Ma'thud is that this sword used to belong to his father. This was one of the things the Prophet ﷺ was given that used to belong to his father. It's one of the remnants of his father, memories of his father. The Prophet ﷺ had another sword by the name of Qala'i, which is the name, Qala' was the name of a town where basically the sword was made. Dhul Fiqar, which is also pronounced as Dhul Faqar, bi kasr al-fa wa bi fathihi. All right, Dhul Fiqar or Dhul Faqar, right? Um, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala mentions in Zad al-Ma'ad that the reason why it was called Dhul Faqar, uh, لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ فِيهِ فَقَرَاتٍ لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ فِيهِ فَقَرَاتٍ A حُفَر صِغَار It had small indentations running along it, like it had a design. There were small little, like, little, um, des- there was a little design in it. Alright, there were little indentations running down it. And it used to catch the eye, particularly during like the, the daytime, when the sun would hit it uh, in a particular way, it would kind of reflect off of it and it would catch your eye. And so it was a very attractive sword. And this is a sword that's oftentimes mentioned that the Prophet of Allah wasallam bestowed upon Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So these are just a few details about some of the swords of the Prophet wasallam and uh, a couple of them exactly, maybe where they originated from or why they were called what they were called, why they were given the names that they were given. Excuse me? Can I repeat the swords' names? Yes, I can. So the uh, name of the swords are Al Ma'thur, Al Qadib, Qadib. Qala'i, Battar, Hataf, Mikhdam, Rasub, Dhul Fiqar or Dhul Faqar, and the last one. Adab, very good, Adab. Adab, Ain, Dad, Ba, Adab. There are a couple of more extra names that are mentioned. Again, there's tons of different narrations and different scholars. Um, Alama Bajuri mentions the fact that there, I was, he was able to find a couple of more names. One of them was a sword that was called Samsama, Samsama. Yes, so uh, that's it. He still mentions nine. Instead of the adab, he mentions samsama. But he still mentions nine of them. So those were the swords of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alright, very good. And I guess we're stopping here. Very good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasafir wa natu